Hi, my name is Shannon Van Horn. As of 6.15 last night, I became the past co-vice chair of the Human Communication and Technology Division. So I'd like to welcome you to our five-year out panel um, from the Human Communication Technology Division, five years out, exploring the future of human communication and technology. We have what we consider to be our um, bright up-and-coming scholars in our area. And I'd like to, I'm going to state your name, and if you would please just wave um, where you are at. We have Esther Har Hargate, and I'm sorry about pronouncing your names. We have Scott, and she is from Northwestern University. We have Scott Campbell from the University of Michigan. We have Kirk Key from the University of Texas, Austin. We have... Alexander Halavez? No, he's not here. Okay. Um, we have Nicole Ellison from Michigan State. We have Star Mirror from George Mason. And we have Jorge Pina from University of Texas, Austin at the end. All right. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk um, briefly about where we have been in the human communication technology area, what some of the theorists and um, people that have helped shape our research. We're going to spend the bulk of today talking about where we are and where we are going and what we are expecting in the future. Um, at, as we um, discuss, the different panelists will be chiming in on their thoughts. I'm not really going to go down the row and say, so Star, what do you think? So Scott, what do you think? We're going to let them chime in um, as communication specialists. I'm sure there will be a lot of chiming. Um, and then we're going to open it up for discussion from the floor. So starting with that, our first question deals with historical development. And my question to the panelists are um, about the historical development of human communication and technology. Who do you consider to be some of the theorists that really help shape your ideas, your research um, in human communication and technology? And I'm opening it up. Go ahead, whoever. Okay. Well, um, Scott. for me personally, um, some of the folks that um, I guess have shaped the way that I've approached my work, and um, just so you know, I mainly study mobile communication um, as, a, as a process, not necessarily as a technology. Um, and, you know, a lot of the work that Janet Folk has done um, with regard to social influence has been very pertinent here. I think um, mobile communication is um, provides a good opportunity for sort of the, the revitalization of a social construction approach and because it, it matters so much who we're in contact with throughout our daily lives. And uh, that's how I think attitudes and uses of this technology get shaped. And she's done a lot of work with, you know, social influence processes. Um, you know, Ron Rice and looking at... Um, some of the relational uses of technology. Joe Walther, who's out in the audience right now, um, you know, those are some of the foundational folks that, that I had initially drew from and tried to extend on later. Okay. Others? I, I just like to echo that really as a scholar and as a, uh, as a friend, I think Joe Walther has really been um, quite influential in my work and really helped as, as a field, helped us kind of move away from the early... Uh, deterministic kind of very simple approaches and really trying to kind of look at the interpersonal um, aspects of, of communication technology without uh, kind of a predisposition to you know thinking about face to face is always always most authentic always best um, and I think also really in kind of providing a set of theories that, that we can draw from um, has been you know, very important okay I'll just, I'll just quickly say, uh, so my training is in sociology, so uh, that area is what shaped a lot of my initial thinking, and one of my advisors was Paul Starr, who, uh, especially with his book, Creation of the Media, I think has contributed quite a bit to how we should be thinking about um, the social context and institutional context of how media develop. And then, um, more generally speaking, in terms of research design and research methods, I, I draw on uh, sociologists like... Uh, again, Paul Dumas and my advisor, um, and others who ha who don't even. I mean, Paul actually does work in this area, but others who don't necessarily work on technology. But I think who 
uh, have um, exemplified the kind of really rigorous research design that we should be applying to whatever work we're doing. And if I can add to the list, I think um, also one of our, our key leaders in our field, uh, Everett Rogers um, from sociology as well, but he's definitely a communication scholar. Um, he was. Um, so, um, so in my own research, looking at technology adoption is a, another important strand, I think, is uh, uh, in, our, in our community here. So uh, I think diffusion innovations has been an important uh, theory. And also, I think, drawing from management, we have De Davis et al. Uh, from the technology acceptance model. And also, Janet Folk and her colleagues, um, social influence, social information, is social information um, processing model. I think those are key theories that I draw from in the area of technology adoption. Okay. Um, Hi, uh, I'm Jorge Peña. I study virtual technologies and gaming in particular. And I think that many of my influences are uh, connected to game design, actually. Uh, as a gamer, when I walk in into a virtual environment and see whatever was going on there, I had a deep uh, sense of disconnection between what I was experiencing in a virtual environment and what I was actually happening in terms of academia. And when trying to bridge uh, that disconnection, I think that the work of Joe Walther was pretty influential. Uh, on this idea of making sense of people in a virtual environment, how do you make uh, impressions, or how do you control the impressions that you, other people are getting from you? So the social information processing model and the hyperpersonal model were very influential to me. At the same time, uh, my background uh, originally is in uh, social psychology. So there's some models that are really interesting to me in terms of the word of Leonard Berkowitz, in terms of media priming, and also the work of John Barge in terms of how priming is a fundamental process in connection to how we react to people <coughs> in a social context. So I would locate that influence in both the communication field and in social psychology, that informing my work. Uh, and at the same time, also with an interest with uh, whatever is going on in the environment, what designers are doing nowadays. Okay. All right. And um, the big question that we have is, where do you feel human communication technology is moving? Where do you think we are headed? Um, what do you th and NCA has um, provided some questions for us. One of the questions they asked is, what do you want to accomplish? What do you think we should, should be accomplished by our centennial? So um, where do you think that, that human communication technology is headed and what do you think we'll be accomplishing five years out? Go ahead. It's wonderful to be labeled a young and up-and-coming scholar on this group. <laughs> um, but uh, when I got the, uh, the notice about this panel, um, one of the uh, uh, resources that our university uses, we're members of the New Media um, Consortium. I don't know if any of your uh, institutions are part of that. And every year they issue a report uh, called their Horizons Report. Uh, and it's a, sort of a modified uh, Delphi methodology where they survey um, leaders in the IT field and find out where the technology is going. Um, so maybe if I just take a, a couple of minutes to summarize, they have three event horizons coming out from their 2009 report. Um, it's uh, basically within the next year, within the next two or three years, and within the next four or five years. And since this was a four or five year um, program, I, I, I thought it might be worth mentioning a few of the things that they talk about. Um, one of the issues that they talk about are the general trends that are happening, and of course globalization is making the research community uh, suddenly um, smaller and more present uh, and available to us. Uh, they also say that most of the digital natives that are coming into our um, universities and colleges now um, are uh, very, uh, very much aware of game-based learning, uh, and they think that's an interesting trend that uh, is going to continue. Um, and of course, there are one billion cell cell phones added uh, every year, uh, and so that's, that's a kind of a trend that they see as well. Um, for challenges, they, they identify um, the uh, um, sort of formal instruction in new literacy skills, including information literacy, visual literacy, um, technology literacy. Uh, my campus struggled with this for, for a long time and came up with some goals um, that kind of guide um, some of the, the curriculum that's being developed about what kinds of skills we want our students to have. Um, and I think over the next period of time, that's only going to be, become increasingly 
increasingly important. Um, and I, I, I've noted there's quite a bit, uh, quite a few panels on visual uh, literacy here. Um, I think um, that there are uh, there are different. Um, uh, different elements of our students. Some of you may have noticed that um, many of our students aren't reading books very much, uh, and uh, and that that's a continual challenge. And how do you how do you tap into that? Um, I myself have noted that my teaching style has changed fairly dramatically with the advent of YouTube, uh, and so I I use a lot of YouTube, and the students are really engaged um, in looking at visual um, artifacts, uh, and and so I think that. The, the teaching that's going to happen over the next four or five years, um, I think, is going to increasingly adapt um, to um, some of their interests and needs. Interestingly, I did a paper on PowerPoint, um, and what they're finding with PowerPoint is that while a lot of faculty think this is neat, cutting-edge new technology that they want to see if they want to adopt in their, in their classes, a lot of students coming in see it as sort of old-school technology uh, and how uh, there's really uh, been some research recently on, on the novelty effect is wearing off on PowerPoint, and students are often getting very tired of PowerPoint abuse. Um, so just kind of quickly is sketching some of the um, technologies that are out there one year out, um, they, they talk about mobile um, learning and being able to um, have uh, information driven uh, to um, mobile devices uh, and being able to tie camera, uh, camera images to specific information. Uh, there are applications where you can take a picture of a book and it will automatically um, come up with this is what that book is and who it's uh, by and where you can buy it. Uh, and that kind of, of interactive mobile technology is, is really um, only uh, only a year out. They also talk about cloud computing. Any of you who have been to Amazon or YouTube know about cloud computing. This is where um, you know a variety of servers are being used to serve or support a particular function. Recently, my uh, school adopted a virtual computing lab which means from anywhere in the world, a George Mason student can log in and can access software applications that can be used on the computer that they're logged in from, which makes uh, you know, the, the, all of the multimedia applications available, all the office and statistical applications available. That is tremendous power. Um, and instead of having to worry about we've got a lab somewhere that has 30 seats that have Dreamweaver on it, now students can access Dreamweaver from any computer on campus and from any computer anywhere. Um, so cloud computing, I think, is really becoming um, one of those issues that is going to transform um, some of the learning experiences. Just very quickly, two to three out, geo everything. I use an iMac, and any pictures that I bring into my iMac tag on where it is, um, and then I can see a whole uh, arena of where all my pictures were taken, uh, and, and I can go to any location uh, and download those. And, and, of course, it's not just a personal application. It's also an application um, for, um, for doing instructional materials and tracking weather, population, urban development, um, and lots of other kinds of things. Um, uh, I'll, I'll drop that. Have any of you ever uh, used Zotero? I don't know, has anyone used Zotero? Okay, if you haven't seen Zotero, Z-O-T-E-R-O dot org, um, it's been built at the George Mason University, and basically never type another citation ever again. <laughs> Browse anywhere online you want. Select from a database all or part of the sources. Bring down the PDFs associated with it. Create your own library, and then insert that into Word or um, Open Office or other word processing at any point in time and compile the entire reference list. Um, it is like EndNote on steroids because it does everything like that, but for all uh, multimedia stuff that's happening uh, uh, in a variety of websites. Um, and then just uh, four to five years out, um, semantic-aware applications. Um, we're already sort of getting this. Um, with uh, um, You're able to join groups in which your tags are fed to other people, delicious and, 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 and other kinds of things. Uh, and um, World Mapper, for example, is an interesting application. Depending on the data that you point it towards, it shifts the size of the world. Population, you get larger um, India, China, um, GDP. 
GDP, you get larger um, Germany uh, and Japan and stuff. And so it's very interesting ways of conceptualizing data um, that happen. Um, and and I, so I just think, it, to me, the, the five-year out horizon, it's really hard to tell. Twitter is obviously um, an interesting 140-character application. Um, you may or may not have just seen it. I was watching a TV in the elevator, uh, and uh, Twitter is now um, being banned from the courtroom because it is a broadcasting device. Um, and I think we're going to see the impact of a lot of, a lot of technologies like that. Um, and so I'll let other people talk about things. But I want you to be aware, the Horizon Report comes out every year. It's very interesting about the newer technologies um, that are going to be accessible to us within some event horizons. So if I can add to what started just started, um, I, when I was asked to be on the, a part of this panel, I was asked to also talk a little bit about um, instructional technology. So that's what, part of what I prepared. So um, in addition to Horizon, uh, Horizon report, which is important, is, um, is uh, NSF, the National Science Foundation, has also released a uh, report on fostering learning in the network world, the cyber learn learning opportunity and challenges. It is the report on of the NSF task force on cyber learning. So um, I think that in the next five years, what we need to pay attention to is the notion of cyber infrastructure, which is uh, an infrastructure that is also referred to as the next generation internet. Um, so in addition to what we know as the internet, which is network connecting PCs to PCs, um, cyber infrastructure will be a network on top of that internet, you'll be connected to a network of supercomputers. And so the computational power, the, the amount of data that you will be able to access and manipulate will be much um, um, bigger than what we uh, can envision today. So the vision of this um, cyber infrastructure or cyber learning will be a cyber-enabled learning environment <coughs> that students and teachers can access uh, through portals, basically. So your desktop can be a portal, your um, iPhone can be a portal, and many other tools can, uh, can allow you to access to that environment. So I think um, within this um, interest of our division, um, if you look at education technology and learning, I think it will be very different um, from what we are um, experiencing today. And the other reason why I bring up this development is because um, if the National Science Foundation has established a new office of cyber infrastructure, and they're pumping money into developing this infrastructure, and uh, right now the direction of this infrastructure is uh, mostly utilized and used by scientists. And in the original vision, uh, the report that was released in 2003, um, which was referred to the Atkins Report, um, science education is part of the vision but it is really underdeveloped right now. And I think that if for any of us who are interested in education technology or the educational instructional potential of this cyber infrastructure, um, I think that it will be um, an opportunity for us to even look for some NSF funding. So that's why I want to bring up this uh, report. So if you're interested, um, you can take a look at this report at the end of this panel. I, I just just real quickly about um, a comment about the discipline of communication, um, not necessarily talking about technology per se, but, um, but NCA and, and communication more broadly as a discipline. Um, I think things are moving in a direction where these boundaries that we have between mass and interpersonal and other types of um, communication contexts are getting blurred um, by the new technologies and how they're used. Um, and I see that continuing, you know, and that's mm -hmm. both an opportunity and a challenge um, for the discipline. It's, it can be challenging for scholars that are out on the job market. You know, what, do I apply for a mass comm job if I study the Internet? Do I apply for an interpersonal job? And, of course, people use the Internet and other media, mobile media, for both. You know, and we see that there are interactive effects in how people use them for mass and interpersonal communication um, in various realms like social capital and uh, civic engagement and things like that. And so, you know, that's one of the things that I think we need to be sensitive to as communication scholars and, and as a discipline and how we structure ourselves and the labels that we use for things. Um, uh, just an illustration of this, you know, um, Castells has um, sort of proposed a new communication context that he calls mass self-communication, and it doesn't cleanly fit in the current boundaries that we have. You know, he's talking about, um, you know, out there... Uh, communicating something from yourself, not through an institutional <coughs> broadcast message or anything like that, and not necessarily to another point, no, another point of contact, but out to the masses, but then you yourself are part of those masses receiving messages from other selves, you know, and so I think that we should 
um, continually think about how we are um, identifying ourselves um, with, within the discipline and what we do and um, you know, be sensitive to, to this boundary blurring that's continually happening. Um, sure. So I could um, add a add a few thoughts to that. Um, so I, I think when I was thinking about kind of where our field needs needs to go, or or what I you know think think we should be thinking about, um, they kind of came down to more specificity, more theory, and more data. Um, so in terms of more specificity, I think any of us who study online tools know that it's a you know rapidly changing target. I mean, just looking at one site, Facebook, and the way that it has added and, and deleted features um, over the you know five years of its existence, I think just um, really points to a need for more specificity when we write up our results uh, in order to allow future scholars to be able to the, interpret the findings within the context in which the, the data were collected. Um, I, I think kind of as part of that, it, it may make more sense to treat these sites as collections of features and to, uh, and to think about the kind of affordances and constraints and, and impacts of things like the profile, the network, the public communication. Because I think to talk about Facebook, for instance, doesn't necessarily um, make sense when it, you know, it's very unlikely that it will look that way in even a few months. Um, I think paying more attention to the, as part of this kind of specificity issue, I think paying more attention to the uh, particular norms of a particular site and treating individual sites and online contexts as kind of specific cultures so that we are more wary of kind of generalizing across all kinds of um, communities and cultures and, uh, and different uh, kind of technical setups. I think in, in, in terms of theory, um, that one of the things that focusing on features as opposed to sites gets us is that I think it allows our work to have longevity so that even when uh, you know, the site is gone, the, you know, the profile will still be around and what we've learned about the profile can be applied to, to future technologies. I think we're at the stage where we're kind of moving from description to, to theory and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I also think that in terms of kind of expanding our sense of the kinds of data that we and, and methods that we could be employing um, <coughs> could, could be very beneficial for the communication discipline and, and the kind of tech, uh, you know, tech focus within communication. So, uh, so ten years ago, I wrote a piece with Peggy McLaughlin um, where we were looking at doing internet research and talking about uh, behavioral data and the fact that. Um, when you go to a museum, that if you look at the the places the where the floor is worn in front of certain paintings, you can see which paintings are more popular. And talking about that as the way that now we can kind of count hits on a website as being this kind of behavioral data. And you know, we have gone so far and beyond counting you know the times that someone hits a site. Uh, I think looking at server level data in terms of really being able to get away from a kind of self report and to be able to really see you know who's replying to who who's looking at whose profile I mean all these sets of things that we just wouldn't really have access to um, to otherwise so I've, I've been working recently with information studies folks and I think that we could learn a lot from different kinds of um, methods specifically looking at server level data um, <clears throat> so I'm going to echo some things that Nicole said, although I think I'm going to say them somewhat differently. Uh, so um, I think a lot of our challenges remain in the realm of research design, and by that I mean thinking about studies carefully from the very first step. Uh, and partly this often means that we shouldn't be driven by the opportunity to have easy access to data to do a study. And I think partly because there's so much information out there that we can just grab, um, I think <clears throat> people, especially graduate students, are often prone to do studies just because the data are there to be had. And I think it's really important to be very careful about making sure that that um, more theoretical, conceptual questions are driving a study and not the availability of data. Um, and also, in term, a, a related issue is that I think we need to be thinking about the long-term relevance of the questions that we're looking at, as opposed to, oh, well, here's a site that's popular today. Let's see what we can do with it. And frankly, I mean, it's not, again, 
um, just as a suggestion in particular to graduate students, um, it, it's, not a, it's probably not a really great way to go on the job market, especially if that site when you're on the job market is already not popular. So it's just really important to, to keep in mind that um, the work needs to be relevant two, three, God forbid, five, ten years down the right road. Um, <laughs> And so I think uh, one way to do that, though, is precisely to move away from, oh, I study Facebook versus I study some social process, and I can do that by looking at XYZ site, perhaps. But to, to focus on the process, on the conceptual question, as opposed to the site or the service. I think that's extremely important. And, um, and this, isn't just, I mean, this, this isn't just students who do this, um, but I think for them, career-wise, it can have more bigger implications. Um, also, uh, somewhat echoing what Scott was saying, although different, using different terms, but I think it's a similar idea, is this, this idea of convergence and that so much is happening, um, that, that similar social processes happen across different media. And so to focus in on a medium isn't going to be very helpful either. Um, and this this raises huge challenges because so much of our methods are around asking about specific media and, and even the specific behaviors related to uh, one medium, but we really need to move beyond that. I think a huge challenge is methodological in that realm because I don't think we've quite figured out how to do that. But again, the issue is don't focus on the medium, don't focus on the technology, rather focus on the larger social process that you're interested in. Um, and then finally, just another... Uh, it's another data issue, but I think um, at least in some realms we, and believe me, I, I appreciate that, that funding is a huge issue in this realm, and that's why I think we haven't really done it, but we really need to move in the direction of longitudinal data because so many of the questions we're asking uh, cannot be answered with cross-sectional data, so we really need to try to collect longitudinal data, but I know that's really easy to say, and I think I know as well as anyone in this room how hard it is to actually do that, but it is a challenge that we need to face. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about one medium in particular, which is games and uh, <coughs> simulations and uh, training simulators in particular. When, when looking at the themes of this literature, I think uh, that we can identify at least three types of questions, and we can call them uh, first-generation questions, second-generation questions, and third-generation questions. First-generation first questions might connect to the idea of media effects, the idea that when you play a violent video game, you as a user may become more violent. And there was a lot of research about that back in the 80s and some of the work that has been done by, for instance, John Sherry summarizing all of that research or the work of Anderson and Bushman will uh, make the claim that there's some effect in terms of media, particularly violent video games, on the user. As we move on and we look at the research in the 90s, we can locate some other themes, like, for instance, this idea of presence or telepresence. Are, do you feel that you're there when you're playing this video game? Or, for that matter, questions about the motivation of the user to employ this technology in the first place. Why do we play games? Is it because we need enjoyment? Is it because we need some sort of achievement in one particular context? And so on. Uh, some work uh, that has been developed, uh, what I will call second generation questions connected to communication, whether interpersonal group communication in the context of people playing a video game. You can think about the work of Nick Gee, for instance, uh, when looking at people in EverQuest and some of the social <coughs> dynamics with, uh, between EverQuest players. Some of my own work looking at communication, particularly socio-emotional and task communication, in the context of coordinating a particular video game, or for that matter, uh, some of the um, other work that has been done in terms of not really verbal communication, but non-verbal communication in a virtual environment. The work of Gary Bente or Jeremy Balenson, for instance, mm -hmm. looking at avatar posture, avatar gestures, eye contact, and things like that. When thinking about the future, I would think that, for instance, we're looking at this idea of serious games. Games are there not only created for the purpose of pure entertainment, but for people to learn something, whether it's something about religion or something that's political or health-related or leadership training or combat simulators and so on. And in that, I locate uh, these third-generation type questions, and in that, I see a great promise. This is the possibility of us communication researchers having an impact. 
an impact in design and the, an impact in the evaluation of all of these new technologies that are, are, are out there, but these designers are wondering whether they are actually causing the effects that they uh, are supposed to, to cause or how to social engineer certain processes like learning or training and so on in the future. I think that that's very fertile ground for the use of theories, some of our more traditional theories, some uh, for the development of new theories, and in particular in terms of getting funding. And by funding, I don't only mean NSF and NIH and so on. I mean funding coming from the army and coming from the private sector, game designers. They want to know, and I think that that's a great opportunity for communication researchers to say something about the particular in terms of evaluating the technologies and helping with the design aspects of the, that particular technology. So I would say that serious games are actually going to be one of the main topics in the next at least five years in terms of communication uh, processes. That is not to say that the idea of media effects or presence or enjoyment or things like that or the motivations to play are going to fade out. That's really not the case. Most, uh, most likely those theories are going to be employed in the context of this other games are not for the uh, only for pure entertainment purposes. Okay. I'm going to ask sort of a three-pronged question, and it has been touched on by each of you, um, but I'm going to ask if you have any other areas to contribute to it. Um, right now, if, if we have a student that's just coming into the division, to human, human communication technology, what are some hot topics that they should be jumping in and exploring? And some of you have touched on this already, but what are some hot topics that really do need to be explored? What are some things that are overdone or oversaturated um, that maybe we it's it's time to move on? And what hasn't been covered that should? And I know that you've touched on this, but I'm going to ask um, for some specific direction for some of... Um, perhaps the new people in the area and as well as for the rest of us? Um, I'd, I'd just I'd identify a couple of uh, things about hot topics. I'm very much interested in um, information overload um, and in particular the way that digital natives are, um, are um, evolving. Uh, there's a, a book out by a neuroscientist called iBrain um, the main hypothesis of which is that uh, human brains are evolving faster now than at any point in human history. Uh, and, uh, um, they, you know, they, they'll do um, studies where they're, they're playing games or they're surfing on the web and they're doing a CAT scan, looking at the activity that's happening in the brain um, during that time. Um, one of the recommendations of the book is that we focus more on developing interpersonal skills um, for those um, teenagers who have spent a lot of time on video games and in video world, um, uh, in, in video worlds, in part because there is a there is a part of the brain that develops a sense of empathy um, when uh, uh, during that that period of time um, when you when you're developing normally. And um, Small is hypothesizing that um, one of the effects of constant use of, of uh, gaming and uh, um, non-face-to-face uh, modalities is that um, you, you, um, you sort of stop developing some of that area. So, so I think one area of interest to me is how digital natives are, in fact, coping with um, the information that they receive. Um, and uh, the, the immediate short-term plea is, um, please, um, let's be carefully looking at age as a factor um, when you do your analysis um, and trying to get uh, populations in which there is a spread of ages um, so that you can really begin to assess whether these effects are generalizable across a spectrum of ages or whether we're really talking about a digital immigrant that's many of us in the audience um, and me up here and digital natives who have only grown up with an internet and, and, uh, and, and their brains are, are shaped in part by that. The one other thing I would just note very quickly is um, I think an area of, of great interest is the personal web um, and that's also noted in the Horizon report. Um, some of you uh, may have noticed that um, heavy users of, of web browsers um, now have all sorts of little interesting little gadgets and bots 
thoughts um, that, that come up in their work environment that enable them to instantly access or continually track um, weather reports, for example. Um, I, I actually have um, Google um, out there searching for me for digital natives, digital rhetoric, and information overload. And every week, I get an email that says, here's the top you know, 50,000 sites um, that have discussed your topics, and here's the top, you know, they, 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 they feed it to me in manageable forms. So I think a very interesting uh, impact of the information society is that we're finding ways to create venues for information to be brought back to us, and I think that personal web um, is really going to explode in the next few years, and you're going to see a lot uh, of that, and I would say that's a hot topic for research. Search. I'd like to respond to this. Um, I think we need a lot of uh, empirical work still on some assumptions we're making about what the spread of digital media is leading to. Uh, so, for example, while there has been a lot of um, conceptual writing done on quote-unquote digital natives versus digital immigrants, the little empirical work that has been done shows that there is uh, considerable variation in terms of uh, literacy with technology even among those who have grown up with digital media. So I think uh, we have to be very cautious about assuming that uh, age is necessarily the most important variable when it comes to differences in how people adopt technologies and their implications for people's lives. So I agree that it's important to have uh, age as a variable and not necessarily a constant, but it's also very important at the same time to keep other variables in mind. And I don't think we've seen enough empirical work to see whether age is actually a more important variable than, say, education or income, socioeconomic status, et cetera. So um, I would caution against... Um, some of these assumptions that we've seen in the literature about how um, just because people grow up with technologies, they inherently have different brains and are developing in different ways, um, and that there aren't other variables that might be going on in, uh, that influence their technology use. Um, just to add to that, and I think to kind of echo some of uh, Esther's comments previous to now, I, I think thinking about the idea that there are hot topics um, seems to be kind of a slippery slope. And I am just really to echo Esther's kind of cautionary tale about for graduate students, for instance, something's hot, you know, it, it may not be later. So if you don't have, if, if, you're not, uh, if you're not discovering something that's going to have enduring value, that's not just about site X at this particular juncture in time, um, you, that's, that work is really not going to be that powerful or uh, useful beyond that particular, um, you know, one set of, of, uh, of findings. So, you know, so, so for instance, and, you know, and I'll be the first to say that, yes, you can really benefit from being kind of one of the early people to look at a topic. Um, but so, for instance, with online dating, when, you know, with the, the thing that kind of drew us to that was we were thinking about these forums where there was no anticipated future face-to-face -face interaction. And thinking about how, you know, the fact that with online dating, you are really there to meet strangers and that that might have an impact on your self-presentational strategy. So, you know, it, did, it was nice that online dating was kind of becoming more popular at the time. Um, but, you know, at least I tell myself that our kind of initial interest was more um, theoretically or kind of conceptually grounded. And so I would really um, encourage folks to make sure that there's something there beyond just that um, hot topic. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> uh, I guess I'm going to disagree a little there. Um, there. I would believe that there are hot topics when looking at the literature in terms of gaming, simulation, and, um, and the like. Uh, one of them, I think, is the idea of transfer. And that has been throughout the literature when you look at the effects of media violence, when you play a uh, violent video game and perhaps becoming more aggressive, to more nuanced questions about, for instance, whether what happens in a virtual environment stays in a virtual environment. For instance, the work of Ian Valenson and my own is showing that avatars may have cognitive effects and behavioral effects on users, and that some of those effects actually may have a perhaps short-term transfer effect in real face-to-face -face settings. That's important, I would believe. Same when you think about the question of serious games for military training purposes. As you guys probably know, uh, the uh, America's Army video game is the uh, US Army video game. You can download it for free and 
get a first uh, try or at least uh, some virtual uh, sense of what it takes to be in the army, although we can debate uh, that a little bit. But I would say the idea of whether when you are exposed to a virtual environment or when you, when you are interacting to it is an ongoing hot topic, and I think that it will be the case for many years to come on this idea that we can use perhaps these technologies not only to look at the entertainment value of them, but also what is happening uh, in our brains or what is happening in terms of our own interpersonal behaviors or group processes as we step out of the virtual environment. Uh, remember, the main goal of the use of America's Army is the idea of preparing you for what's going to come. And that's basically uh, what I see in a lot of these technologies in terms of whether it's what's happening in the virtual environment stays there. Uh, I would like to, um, I agree with all the t hot topics that have been mentioned already, but I, um, I'm going to offer some suggestions from the context of funding. Um, I think that I want to mention that, um, again, back to the reference of the National Science Foundation having an office of cyber infrastructure, and that's technologically in nature, and I think that gives us a lot of opportunities to, um, to extend our research. And I want to mention two particular topics that are uh, hot, in my opinion, in the context of cyber infrastructure. Uh, number one is virtual organization. Uh, because National Science Foundation for the past two years have actually put up solicitations looking specifically for researchers, social scientists to study virtual organizations as so, uh, social technical systems. So I think that there's, um, there's money there. That means it's hot. Also, um, a lot of uh, um, <laughs> that's my opinion. I need to speak from a funding perspective. So um, the other is uh, out of this concept of cyber infrastructure and virtual organization, there's been articles and books coming out of um, the field of information science and science techno technologies on the topic of distributed collaboration. And I think that's uh, the other area that uh, our, our scholars within our community are well positioned to tackle as well. But, um, but these topics are mainly pursued by people in science and technology studies as well as um, uh, information science. So. Uh, I think that within the field of communication, the topic of cyber infrastructure hasn't caught on yet. Um, but if you go to information science conferences and science and technology, you notice that the key people in those fields are really pursuing um, this topic. Um, so moving on from um, NSF, I'm going to mention NIH, and I think the topic of e-health and cyber medicine will be hot topics as well. Um, even though I'm not very familiar with that funding agency and how the mechanism um, operate within that uh, context, but I think that we should turn our attention to those um, um, terms. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is that with NEH, they have an Office of Digital Humanities. So if, you're, uh, one of, if you, your work, your research is in, in, in more of humanistic uh, nature, with, is more humanistic in nature, and you're not necessarily interested in um, quantitative research or... Um, uh, doing um, actual interviews, you're interested more in archival research, and I think um, uh, the Office of Digital Humanities will offer opportunities for um, humanistic scholars to look for fundings as well. So I would suggest to look to the funding agency, the major funding agencies, in addition to what Jorge just mentioned, um, the Army, um, as another source as well. Um, I think look for what is hot within um, um, the funding and atmosphere and environment right now and uh, pursue those topics. And I think that's also, um, that will be aligned with what Esther mentioned as well. Don't pick a topic that will die soon. So if, the, if NIH has an Office of Digital Humanities, we know that that concept is not going to die very soon. If, the, if uh, NSF has a co off new Office of Cyber Infrastructure, that's not going to go away very soon as well. So I would recommend um, our community to, to, to take up those topics in our research. I'd like to just add that something we haven't mentioned, and I realize this isn't concrete at all, but um, I think a hot topic for you, in addition to the importance of solid research design and conceptual question, is you have to be passionate about what you're studying, and I think it's much more important than actually being able to get millions of dollars to study it. Like, I've never, I've never chased funding. I'm, I've done pretty okay. I've gotten some funding. I haven't gotten others. Um, but I'm still passionate about what I study, and I, I don't believe you can do the work if you're not passionate about it. I certainly don't believe you can do a good job with it. So that might sound trivial, but I think it's really important to say because I think this super ultra utilitarian approach to chasing funding I don't think is necessarily work out going to work out per se. And also, I mean, they're actually, even if certain government agencies do have programs, 
Uh, those change too, and they change by administration, and they change in other ways. Um, for me, the, uh, my topic is digital inequality. Uh, the administration really didn't care for most of the last eight years, and so, no, I didn't really get funding from federal agencies. I got funding from elsewhere. And, wow, suddenly they really care, and I got, like, six phone calls from the FCC in one month. And um, But now I'm in a position to decide what I actually want to work on. So... Uh, I don't know. I think you, you really need to be passionate about what you're studying and don't forget that component. I'm going to add to that that probably a passionate researcher is probably to get funding too. I mean, they don't, being passionate about what you study, it's only probably going to increase the probability of you meeting people at conferences, putting your work out in the venues that matter, and so on. Uh, I would argue that being passionate and getting funding is actually, there's a positive correlation there rather than them being disconnected. Okay, I'm going to give our um, panel a one-minute challenge. They each get one minute to express anything about human communication technology that we did not cover here, sort of a wrapping remark, and then we're going to open it up to the floor for some passionate dialogue. So who would like to go first? One minute. I guess I'm first in line. <laughs> one minute. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, one is that um, increasingly there are technologies that can help you um, uh, take a, a, a website um, and, and save it in its entirety so that it can be studied over time. We, we've talked a little bit about how rapidly the things change and you may come back to a site that you were studying and find that it's actually gone. This particularly happens in political communication, but it happens with other kinds of... of uh, uh, and, and so to my knowledge, um, Adobe Acrobat allows you to save an entire website um, and do it uh, um, up to a certain number of levels. Zotero also has the capability of taking a snapshot of every web page that you visit um, if you want to add that into your, into your bibliographic references. Um, and finally, um, for, um, for usage, um, I know that there have been people on our campus that have studied um, actual usage patterns um, by using Camtasia, which is actually a, a kind of a training video builder. Um, you, can, you can record mouse clicks and stuff like that, um, but they're using that as a way to study how people use um, and uh, other than you know the sort of the high end kind of applications that'll do that Camtasia costs about hundred and thirty dollars or something so um, so I, my, my view is is I think there are technologies that we might take advantage of um, that that will help us to study something even if we're only capturing it in a period of time um, even if uh, you know we, we really need to do longitudinal kinds of work which I, I, I sort of agree with but easier said than done Scott? Um, I guess I think it's important that we um, maybe not get too caught up in what's new and what's technological and try to keep our stuff grounded in some of the fundamental um, processes of communication, what it is that we're doing as people when we're creating meaning together. Um, and, you know, we do this through technologies. We do it, you know, face-to-face. -face. We do it in various contexts um, and so I think it's important to look at, um, you know, not, not just what technologies we're using and, and how we're using them and how much we're using them, but, you know, who we're using them with and the way that people rub off on one another, um, the reasons why we're using them. You know, I, I just think that a lot of what we're doing um, can still be grounded in some of the old fundamental questions that we asked and um, that we can consider technology as kind of, you know, new platforms through which those things take place. And then starting from there, we can look at maybe new forms of social order and, you know, new forms of, for example, social capital, you know, redefined social capital when people are connecting through technologies. Rather than starting with, with the new, you know, starting with the old and then working our way to the new. I don't know if this made sense, but at any rate, as a communication scholar, I feel a lot of pressure from folks, maybe I should say as a communication junior scholar, I feel a lot of pressure from folks to, you know, to, to jump on what's hot and what's new. And we've heard a lot of good cautions, I think, from the panel about doing that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, it's tempting, you know, when the press, you know, is, is interested in, in this and you get interviews and that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to think about 
you know, fundamentally, what is what is communication? What are we doing as you know when we communicate, and and then looking at how that plays out in in new formats and new media. Okay, Kirk. All right, I actually have three points I would like to share. Um, I, I think this is more like a three points that I, uh, I think that our community, HCTD, um, can pay attention to. I think traditionally we've done very well in isolating technology in, 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 in social interactions. So what I mean by that is that I, this is a critique of my own research as well. So when I study Facebook, I assume students use Facebook um, in isolation. I don't connect that their use of Facebook to perhaps their use of cell phone and MySpace and other technologies as well. So I think we're at a point where we can perhaps extend our research uh, to look at how multiple technologies work in sequence, in combination, and, or simultaneously um, as a way to extend our uh, fuller picture understanding how uh, human communication and technology intersect. So the other thing I want to uh, mention is that I think traditionally we have done a very good job at drawing a line between the online world and the offline world. And, but we know that what happens online translates often into the offline and vice versa. So I think that at this point in our research, it's time to move forward and combine, to really collapse the two worlds and look at how the online and uh, offline would really work, in, uh, work in, um, in concert to create our understanding of human communication. And the third point I want, to make, uh, I want to make is that I think within our community, we've traditionally interpreted the, the term technology as information and communication technology. So we have <coughs> sort of, we've done a very good work at uh, looking at the, hum the, the information and communication function of technology, but I think we can extend this um, term to uh, broadly cons um, include um, other technologies, material technologies, such as maybe the physical environment, the table, the chairs, and how those things work in, con uh, work in concert with information and communication technologies in impacting human interactions. So those will be three things that I'd like to share, and I, I think that will extend our research um, to help us capture a fuller picture of human interactions. Maybe the following is kind of boring or not fair because it could be said on any for any field, but I think solid research design, solid research design, and solid research design, which leaves me <laughs> about 40 <laughs> seconds to explain what I mean. Um, so uh, I think uh, a lot of projects basically bomb in the first 20% of the work done on them because the research design is not solid. And so I think people need to be thinking much more carefully about how to study the various uh, things they're studying. And one way to make sure that they're not walking into traps early is to get feedback from other researchers. I, I don't know. I, I feel like people aren't doing enough of that early enough not to completely mess up a project, and then all that 80% of the work was for naught, because if the research design up front is bad, the project is gone. And I really don't think enough uh, scholars appreciate that point. So I'll just leave it at that. Sure. I guess um, one, one thought that I th we haven't touched on at all, but I think we need to think about, especially in this, this division, is looking at modes of dissemination, how we're getting our research out there and who is our audience. Um, I think in terms of academic and scholarly um, audiences, the, the publishing time frame, I, I, you know, I know I'm not alone in just feeling incredibly frustrated by the, by the fact that sometimes I'll get a review back and they will you know, cite me or fault me for something that has changed, you know, since I submitted it, and just the, you know the fact that um, that that the time horizon, especially I think for junior scholars, it's it's just really um, really a problem, as I as I know, you know, across disciplines. Um, but I think also reaching out to other fields. So, for instance, I think JCMC is a really nice example of a you know it's an online journal with with very you know high caliber high caliber work that is public and thus you know the the um, you know this the citation counts for JCMC are are well at least in my experience um, higher than others because it's so accessible um, and you know Google Scholar seems to really uh, for that reason kind of privilege those um, uh, those pieces. So I think. So I think thinking about kind of academic dis dissemination, and then also to you know to society at large, to the public. Esther mentioned FCC. So having a you know having a say in, in policy debates. I think in terms of technologies, you know, oftentimes there are public narratives that are circulated that are that are are untrue and that cause people to. Um, you know, worry about things that aren't really what they should be worrying about, and to perhaps kind of deny 
uh, you know, just children access, for instance, because there's the fear of a stranger reaching out through MySpace and grabbing them, and thus, you know, the so what are the kind of um, you know social capital and technical expertise, and what are the other uh, <laughs> negative outcomes that that stem from that um, that are, that are kind of unnecessary. So I so I think thinking about dissemination both. Um, scholarly and to the, the society at large and public is something that we could be doing more of. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I, I think I would like to speak about three topics. First, uh, who cares? Who cares about, <laughs> about Second Life, virtual worlds, the games are out there, and so on? Uh, some, wh what I mean by that is that and I need to give some credit to Joe Walter there for trying to make me think that way. But these technologies come and go, right? Uh, we were talking about EverQuest when doing game research a few years ago. That's not anymore around. And people are talking about Second Life now or World of Warcraft. Who cares really about the particular technology? I believe that, same as some of you said, we care more about the fundamental processes that happen through technology or how fundamental processes are affected by technology, at least from my uh, recent program. Uh, so I think that we, we need to, uh, of course, take care of the idea of, yeah, we cannot really focus on the object that much. We need to focus more on the fundamental communication dyna dynamics affected or happening in that particular context. The other thing that we have, uh, I feel that we have not talked about, or I have not talked about, is about theory. And I feel that uh, in gaming research, theory is pretty strong. For instance, the application of social information processing models and hyperpersonal models in terms of explaining what's going on as people coordinate a particular game, or the revival of, uh, what is it, uh, self-perception theory and priming models in trying to explain what happens in a virtual environment, how your cognition is being affected in that particular context. And of course, the uh, long-standing tradition of stu uh, studying enjoyment when you are in a virtual context and the study of presence. So I do believe that uh, when, when thinking about this type of research, I think that uh, someone once said that, oh, when I was presenting my research, I said I do new communication technologies. Oh, poor you. You need to keep track of both theory and what's out there at the same time, or at least that person said that. And I kept scratching my head a little bit, and I go back and forth on this question, and some days I'm more theory, some days I'm more on what's out there. But I do believe that as uh, communication technology researchers, we are more interested in the fundamental processes, and at the same time, as you guys know, and you're being faulted by that sometimes, and me too in my papers, there's stuff out there happening, and we also need to keep an eye on that. The third point I would like to touch on that is the social impact of our research. I do believe that funding is important and actually hitting the media in terms of uh, the importance of our research is important. I do believe that we need to take the goal, uh, take on the goal of shaping the debate about the effects of technology. That people, when thinking about who's going to evaluate whatever is going on in a virtual environment and so on, I want them to think about communication researchers and not cognitive psychologists. Okay. We have 15 minutes. I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. If you have questions, you're going to need to be loud so that we can hear you all the way up here. Um, but, okay, let's go here, and then we'll go with you in the black. Let's go here first. I'm curious what role, if any, you think critical and rhetorical methodologies have to offer the field. Because I heard you talk about a lot of different theoretical or methodological approaches to communicating the science. And I don't really agree with a lot of that. But I'm curious what role, if any, I'm sorry, what was the journal you were talking about? JCMC. Uh, JCMC. 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 J
um, was that there is uh, a, a dramatic increase in the quality and the specificity of the research in the 40 years since they've sort of been associated with it, um, various time frames, different ages. But um, uh, so, so they actually viewed a lot of what's happening as very positive. Um, and, uh, um, but, but I would have to echo that it's quite disconcerting to see um, journals excluding a particular uh, approach or methodology um, when, in fact, um, it can sometimes provide insights that you can't get um, from surveying people or from, from generating quantitative um, information. I agree with you. I think it's troubling. If you can add a suggestion, is to uh, find a group of scholars that you would like to speak to. Uh, if you are interested in employing a critical perspective to study technology, so two communities I can think of um, that you may be familiar with. Uh, one is ARST, an Association for the Rhetoric of Science and Technology. So, uh, visiting the, the 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 key scholars in, in in that community and finding where they publish, where they have success with publishing their work would be a good place to go. And the others look into science and technology studies. I think that the critical view is actually welcome and valued in that particular community. So in addition to sharing your work within communication, I would suggest perhaps looking beyond just the traditional HCTD community, but also look at other communities that you may be able to share your work. OK, you had a question. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, I'm coming. Uh, well, uh, tough question. Do we understand the technology? I think that uh, sometimes uh, some people are interested in media effects, uh, in particular when exposed to a particular uh, political uh, website or when doing something in an online context, might be interested in how varying particular features may affect particular outcomes in users, and that might be perhaps experimental work <coughs> right there. Well, some of the assumptions of that work is interesting. At the same time, I believe it's, um, it can get a little bit cumbersome because uh, it's uh, basically a study that would vary something about the technology and see how tweaking this feature or some other feature would have an effect in the particular outcomes out of that interaction. So basically what you get there is a, a very detailed study about varying features that gets a little bit disconnected perhaps and gets a little bit too complex and then we may ask the question, what's the theory behind all of those variations? At the same time, it's, it's important to understand the, the, the effects of media and perhaps design, if that's what you meant by your question. But there's also, when, when doing that type of research, some people may, may think that you're doing a, a little bit of an assumption of technological determinism on the idea that by tweaking certain features or by looking at certain uh, uh, features of the technology that you're assuming that they have strong effects on people's cognition, behavior, and emotion, and that they will, some people would criticize that type of, those type of approaches on making strong assumptions of the effects that these features are having. So I think that it's important for us to look at features of the technology and how they affect human interaction under the assumption that technologies are not neutral. Yes, we socially con construct technologies and appropriate them and so on, but at the same time, just because of the features that are embedded in that technology, for instance, when it, you're in a violent video game and you see blood, gore, and people dressing black and things like that, then that's definitely having an effect on the user at the same time. But I would caution the, the, the researcher there, and I question, caution myself there, on walking a fine line between looking at the social construction aspects of technology and looking at the more deterministic aspects of technology at the same time. Other Just, I, I guess uh, as, an, as an approach, um, 
for trying to understand the technology. I mean, I'm not going to answer whether we understand it or not, but as an approach for understanding it, um, I think it's always a good idea to ask, you know, what are the generic properties here, you know? And, you know, you might feel like you're wandering into deterministic territory or something like that. But, I mean, as long as you're not just, you know, exclusively focusing on the generic properties themselves. But you do have to have an understanding of what are, what are the generic properties of this, you know, in the context of other media, you know, horizontal flows of communication as opposed to, you know, broadcast messages – certainly can yield different effects, right, in, in a political context or something like that, or have interactive effects or things like that. But at any rate, um, it might be just a very simple way for people, um, you know, not necessarily to, to grasp, you know, an understanding of, of the technology, but at least the, the properties and the basic affordances, you know. So that would be my advice to, to others that, you know, how do I understand the technology? Look at the generic properties and then go from there. Other questions? Or any comments? I mean, I, I'd be curious to hear if people have answers to some of the questions that we were posed. <laughs> okay, Jill. I'd just like to re to respond to two questions back um, in terms of critical methodology and cultural theory and so forth. I think then we find ourselves in an interesting time for people who are trying to do that kind of research and who would like to apply it technological studies. I think there are now more association journals uh, from NCA and ICA that are that are strictly oriented toward uh, cultural and critical methodologies than we've ever seen before. I think we saw an explicit shift of, of title for the journal that formerly was Critical Studies of Mass Communication. And, and what is the current title that is no longer mass communication, it's more broadly media oriented. But I'm, I'm surprised <coughs> that the JCMC has an explicit methodological uh, editorial statement. That, that will shift, of course, with whoever is, is editor at the time. But I think there are probably a lot of big, I, I don't think one should change the opportunity to, to publish good research by, by the methodological restrictions one might think that one, one journal has. JCMC is a great journal. There are many, many other good journals. I think ultimately there's, there's, uh, there's lots of room for really good research uh, from a variety of, of, of different perspectives. I know in my own thinking of it, very strongly influenced by uh, some postmodern claims, some uh, neo-Freudian claims about the nature of identity online. I think I think some of Nicole's very stimulating work, some of Jorge's very stimulating work, could be uh, 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 has the potential to be approached from a from a, a, a Burke's pentad perspective. When we ask who is who is the actor, who is the agent, what is the scene, mm -hmm. and so forth. And if we were to learn something new from that kind of approach, I don't think there's anybody who wouldn't value it. If, if that kind of approach were to set a research agenda uh, that would help us understand the field a little bit better, I, I, I don't think anybody would value that, and I don't think the journal would turn a blind eye to it. I think, unfortunately, as, as happened in rhetorical studies, it was Lloyd Bitzer in the 70s, who said, we don't, we don't need any more studies showing that, once again, Aristotle was correct. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need more studies saying, and here's how Aristotle can help us understand yet, yet another new setting. I think because critical studies often uh, refer refer back to uh, uh, here's here's another way to show that Marx was correct, and here's another way that a feminist understanding completely accounts for something. We don't necessarily generate new questions or new insights as a result of that, other than showing that there was a perfect fit. Uh, people who find gaps in understanding and opportunities. Uh, uh, good theory is good theory. Whether you choose to pursue theoretical questions from one method or another. I think is secondary to what is a really interesting new idea. And if, if, I, if JCMC is close to that, it would surprise me. Journal of communication tends to be more open to those kinds of things. Your critical journals uh, should be like everybody else and be following uh, uh, the, the general interest in, in uh, good studies on technology. And so uh, I, I wouldn't give up uh, uh, if I were somebody pursuing that, that line of research. But I would also be... Uh, Ready to ask myself: is, is, is my research shedding new insight rather than trying? Is it opening doors rather than closing them? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, that's probably a good question for anybody in any line of research. But uh, 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 I think that's something to think about it as these fields progress and as the opportunities for, for good critical studies are, uh, I think, uh, greater than they've ever been. Okay. Yes, you had a follow up. I, I guess my comment there in response, and it's a comment that I think you can respond to. I 
wonder what the benefit is of segregating these journals of saying we're going to have a critical conversation over here and a quantitative conversation over here. Because at least in my research, I, I find that having those methodologies and conversations is useful for me. I, I can pull things from people who join work outside my methodology, and it benefits my research. <coughs> and I, I'm, I, I'm nervous about the notion that we're not talking to each other. I, 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 um, I hear you. <laughs> um, but I, I also don't know that just having, uh, I, I think it's just as easy to look at the table of contents, you know, see a co you know, code <coughs> word in it and gloss right over it as it is to never pick up that journal. So I, I, I think there is an issue there. I just, um, I don't know that that's, you know, the primary cause of it, definitely. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think also with, with JCMC, uh, I, you know, I'm wondering if it's the difference between them preferring uh, empirical work, which could be qualitative or quantitative, or, um, or, or kind of your understanding. So, I mean, I, I definitely would be quite surprised if they are not accepting empirical qualitative, qualitative approaches. That, I think that would be a pretty dramatic shift. Um, hey. But I don't know. Is anyone else familiar with that? I, I just reviewed yeah. qualitative. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we recently submitted a qualitative paper that they reviewed, so I don't I think it might be empirical versus. No, that's I, I appreciate yeah, that, but you said versus quantitative, which I mean, there's a lot of work in between. So just to just so we're on the okay. same page about that, Scott, you were going to. I was just going to suggest that you also, if you're not already looking at it, take a look at New Media and Society because they do a really good job of having folks from different camps, humanities, social science, um, talking to one another within the pages of that journal. So. If you, if you don't like what the editorial policy is at JCMC, that's another outlet that I think is, you know, very reputable and has a lot of interesting work in it. There's also IJOC that I don't know what the International Journal of Communication mm -hmm. that's also online and freely available, so it has that advantage over a lot of others. Okay, time for one more, or was a comment or no? Go ahead. Uh, I would say absolutely uh, that we are heading that direction. But when thinking about that, I'm thinking about Kurlewin and the idea that there's nothing more practical than a good theory. When we have a good framework that is uh, capable or enabling you to ask interesting questions that may have design implications, that may allow you to go beyond a particular point in case, like this idea that a virtual environment may have priming effects on the user, is something that is not only academic as a question, it's also something that would interest game designers, and I know that many of our communication colleges, USC, UT, and a few others, Rutgers, are interested in putting game design um, into their curriculum. And I think that that's a need insertion for the social scientist that has some, something to say, some theory that may allow you to illuminate particular processes. Some of them may connect to design, like when you're looking at the effects of avatars on the user. If you have a good theory, you can go beyond the avatar. Who cares about the avatar? It's more about how situational cues are making perhaps a user or helping you feel, think, or behave in certain ways. So I would say that that's uh, probably going to be a way of, of the future, this idea of incorporating or our knowledge into game design. But at the same time, I would be uh, making some cautions there in terms of let's keep the eye on the ball, which is theory. Theory and data, in a sense, is enabling to say something that may uh, illuminate or help game design or the uh, simulation design and so on. If I can just add to that uh, as well, um, I, I'm so glad you brought up the question of design. Um, um, the, the reason, actually, the, the office cyber infrastructure. I'm sorry, I bring I bring up that uh, office again. Um, the founding uh, director, Dan Atkins, uh, intentionally hired a few social scientists to be in his office, and the goal was to incorporate uh, what science, social scientists have to say about technological design. 
So I think uh, despite the, um, the funding uh, opportunities um, and also the negative connotation that comes with, uh, goes with funding, um, I, it just shows that um, I think that people are interested um, in what social science, scientists have to say about design, and I think that um, it is definitely an area that where we can make a contribution to. And I'll just point out also that there's a whole series of kind of the ACM outlets, CHI, CSCW, HICS, um, where a lot of COM people do publish there as well. And I think that's, um, that's where some of those questions are kind of playing themselves out as well. Okay, I would like to thank our panelists. If we could all give them a round of applause for their insight. And thank you for coming to our five-year-old panel, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.